Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Megan Siebel, the Acting Director of External Affairs here at the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations, and welcome to our monthly industry day hosted by External Affairs. Today's event, event is the first in our reverse industry day series. And in this series, we at OBO are taking a step back to listen to and learn from our valued partners, some of whom we have been working with for decades. From OBO leadership joining us today is Managing Director of Construction and Security Management, Tracy Thomas, and members of the Offices of Design and Engineering, Construction Management, Program Development and Coordination, and Security Management. From the State Department's Office of Procurement, also known as AQM, uh, we have representatives here for your questions, as well as the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization Office. Our External Affairs Industry Engagement Advisor, Lauren Luckett, will be sharing helpful resources throughout the event in the chat, and we'll also be moderating the Q&A at the end. Uh, this presentation will be sent out to all attendees uh, following the event, along with a survey. So to begin, I'd like to introduce OBO's director, Ambassador Moser, a career foreign service officer who's been an ambassador not once, but twice. He served as the US ambassador to Kazakhstan from 2019 to 2021, and the Republic of Moldo Moldova from 2011 to 2015. We are very grateful for his lifelong public service to the United States, his leadership here at OBO, and his presence here today. Thank you so much, Director Moser, over to you. Well, Megan, thank you very much for that very, very kind introduction. And uh, I wanna thank you and all of the external affairs team for doing this. And I think this is a great initiative to have a reverse industry day where our industry partners are the hubs. I also want to do one small correction in my, my biography to let you know that I feel that uh, my, it's not the, uh, the years I've spent as ambassador that really qualify me to be the director of OBO. For many years, I, uh, for most of my career, uh, I have been a management officer overseas, and I have been both the an implementer of the OBO's programs and also one of those uh, customers uh, that are actually asking OBO for services and help. So I have I try to bring a, that customer perspective uh, to my job as director every single day because I know uh, that our true mission is to serve those people in the, the in the field. And I want to give a special thanks uh, to all of those of you joining us today and a very very uh, hearty welcome to the American International Contractors Incorporated Special Project or I always say it the fast way, AICISP, KCCT, and RHI. And I really appreciate the effort that you put in today to, to, uh, uh, to, to have this seminar. OBO's goal, its mission, is actually very, very simple. OBO provides effective facilities for United States diplomacy uh, abroad. And this is our one and only goal. And I've already mentioned the importance of customer service in this. And But really, it is not a cliche to say that the only reason OBO exists is to provide the, a service to our customers, because it is those customers who are executing U.S. diplomacy at our 290 missions around the world. And, but today, uh, given the sponsors of this event, I want to really thank our industry partners. And uh, one of the things that is very clear to me in all the times I have worked, uh, well, uh, I have worked uh, with OBO and I have been the, the director or managing uh, or the acting director for OBO, that uh, we cannot do our jobs with the hard work and dedication of our industry partners. And it's, the, uh, and it's our partners, creativity and dedication that makes it possible for us to carry out our in, uh, international uh, maintenance and construction program. It is, it, it is even more critical in today's changing world uh, that, uh, to have 
very, very strong partnerships uh, and get new ideas for solutions from our embassy partners. And so we're hoping that today, through this reverse industry day, we will catalyze an effective discussion to find new uh, the, uh, solutions to our uh, uh, to the problems that we have in our programs worldwide. And then I also uh, 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 want to thank all the members of the OBO team who are uh, working on this today, starting with our managing director Tracy Tom Thomas. Tracy has a distinguished career in, uh, in the State Department, and she has uh, rendered uh, uncountable acts of, of, uh, acts of courage and service to uh, the overseas buildings operation. She is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service with over 30 years of federal and private sector uh, uh, experience. And she has been recognized uh, uh, count, uh, uh, countless times for, uh, with numerous awards for her performance and leadership. So Tracy, over to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Moser, and welcome to everyone on, especially our presenters that I have the privilege to introduce. As Ambassador Moser said, my name is Tracy Thomas. I'm the Managing Director responsible for OBO's offices of Construction Management and Security Management. As for our presenters today, this is the first in our series of Reverse Industry Days. I am grateful for their willingness to share their experiences in tackling the challenges and risks that may deter some firms from working with OBO. We look forward to hearing their practical real life solutions and best practices. We believe that this will foster a transparent dialogue and an exchange of insights and ideas. We want to promote greater collaboration and innovation. We trust the conversation today will provide better understanding of OBO's work and the role that you can play in building effective diplomatic facilities around the world. As Megan described, this event's reverse nature means that OBO will listen and respond to the contractor presentations rather than being the primary presenter. The first contractors to present in this series, and I want to acknowledge their courage in going first, are, as Ambassador Moser said, American International Contractors Special Projects, also known as AICISP. We have KCCT, and RHI. Their presentation is on the challenges they have during design development in OBO design build projects, and specifically the new US Embassy compound in Doha, Qatar. Joining us today from these firms are Mike Kowalski, president of AICISP, Stephen Block, principal of KCCT, and Jake Fedig, associate landscape designer at RHI. AICISP has been working with OBO since 2006. They are our design build contractor on the new embassy compound in Doha. They are a construction engineering firm specializing in complex large scale projects, usually for the government and military installations. They are known for their work in overseas construction, including embassies, military bases, and other secure facilities. AICISP handles various aspects of construction management, including design, engineering, procurement, construction, ensuring that the projects meet stringent safety and security standards. Secondly, KCCT is the designer of record working for AICISP. They have worked on OBO projects since 1986. They are an architecture and design firm specializing in providing comprehensive architectural planning and interior design services. They are known for their work with government and institutional clients 
particularly in designing and renovating embassies, consulates, and other secure facilities. KCCT focuses on creating functional, sustainable, and aesthetically pleasing environments that meet the specific needs of their clients. Finally, RHI rounds out the team here today as the landscape architect for the Doha New Embassy Compound. They have been working on OBO projects for more than 20 years. RHI is a landscape architecture, planning, and urban design firm creating sustainable and innovative solutions for public and private spaces. Their work includes urban planning, park and recreation design, transportation planning, and environmental restoration. They are known for their collaborative approach and commitment to enhancing the quality of life through thoughtful and impactful design. Our partnerships with all of you are critical to the program's success. And today's engagement is vital as we share idols, ideas and experiences around our common challenges. And we look for new approaches and perspectives to respond to unique challenges. With that, I hand the program over to AICISP's president, Mike Kowalski. Thank you, Tracy, for that introduction, and uh, thank you to OBO for uh, inviting us here today. Uh, we'll now proceed with our presentation on the design development for OBO design build projects. We'll be using the Doha NEC project as our case study. This project is about 50% through construction. Our presentation will start with a description of the design process. This will be followed by design goals, and then the challenges of achieving those goals, followed by the strategies to overcoming those challenges and finishing up with lessons learned. I will now hand over to Stephen to start the discussion on the design process. Next slide, please. Thanks, Mike. Um, just waiting for that next slide to kick over. Um, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll begin uh, the conversation uh, by describing an abbreviated version of how OBO begins a new project and the overall process prior to awarding the project to a design build contractor. The process begins with site selection and the advanced planning, which is led by the real estate branch of OBO who will research and identify one or more sites for consideration for a new embassy or consulate compound. Once the potential sites are selected, OBO will hire an AE design firm uh, to do an initial advanced planning assessment, which includes uh, in, in, an initial site analysis, research of local codes, interviews with local authorities, and a risk assessment. Uh, these, these this process also includes initial discussions on contract uh, construction planning and a rough order of magnitude cost estimate. Based on the analysis, OBO is, will then select one or more sites uh, to advance to their next phase. Uh, technical due diligence has a typical duration of about four to six months. And this phase is often completed by the same AE team from advanced planning to produce a more comprehensive site analysis which will be developed into three concepts. Uh, deliverables include site layouts, a more developed risk analysis and cost estimates. It even goes as far as to include some initial thoughts on how the construction might be phased. The process includes working closely with OBO through workshops and multiple draft submittals, followed by an OBO comment period. The next submission will incorporate the OBO comments into a final re report that OBO will then discuss with senior management who will select one option uh, to develop into the bridging documents. Once the site and design options have been selected, they will con uh, contract once again with an AE. Often it's the same AE, although um, I think occasionally it, it may change. Uh, to produce bridging documents that will become the basis of the RFP package and be put out to bid for design build contractors to, to price. 
The bridging document phase is the longest phase up to this point and has a typical duration of around 24 months. However, the design may be expedited depending on current events and needs at the existing posts. A typical design uh, bridging design will include a full design concept with architectural drawings developed to between 30 to 60 percent, while the engineering drawings may be developed to 50 to 30 percent level. The design intent must be complete with enough information provided to generally proof out the design to make sure it's feasible and constructible. And upon completion of the bridging process, OBO will review all bids and award the project to the winning design build team, which Mike will talk about in the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I will now discuss the design process from the time of contract award. Initially, there's a approximately 30-day administrative period to get bonds, et cetera, in place. Uh, you'll then move into starting with an LNTP for the design. While that is beginning, the construction team will begin the securing of the site. Uh, this will include building temporary facilities, fences, getting temp TSS in place. We'll then have early site packages on a typical project um, as the construction team looks to get started on grading, foundations, some of those items. While we move forward into the four required design submissions per contract. The first being the CD1 60% design. Uh, this is also critical because this is the when the congressional certification period would begin at the end of the CD1 submission. Uh, we'll discuss that further on the following slide. Uh, at the same time, we'll start with LN, some LNTPs. There'll probably be multiple depending on the project for some early construction projects. We then move to the CD2. 90% design submission, which will then be followed by the CD back check, 100% design. And finally, the IFC uh, with the full NTP for construction. At that point, you move into the full construction phase. And of course, as this is a design build contract, you will continue to have design services throughout the duration of the project. We'll now, we'll now move into a discussion on the interim design review process, as well as congressional certification on the next slide with Stephen. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, a couple of unique parts of the design process specific to working on OBO projects, as Mike mentioned, include the IDR process and congressional certification. The interim de development uh, review, otherwise known as IDR, is the process by which OBO reviews a submission from the DB team. Uh, OBO is a very sophisticated client and is also very involved throughout the entire design process, helping to make sure that all requirements are being met and verifying that the DB team is adhering to the bridging design intent. At each submission, OBO will review the drawings and specifications and provide comments to the DB team throughout uh, through Progenet C, or sorry, excuse me, through Progenet, which is the vehicle they use to communicate back and forth uh, with the design team. Uh, and, and then we will respond to those. The timeline for this process varies slightly per project, but generally takes about 30 days once the submission is made. OBO will hold an internal kickoff meeting uh, with all reviewers and the OBO project team, DS, tenant agencies, and post personnel will begin making comments. All, all com comments are typically available within two week time frame, and the DB team will have approximately one week to evaluate and respond. OBO reviewers will then have an opportunity to back check their comments. Um, usually it takes about a week um, and can hopefully close the majority of the comments. However, any open comments will be discussed in a resolution meeting between the reviewers and the design build team. For Doha, the IDR process was extended from the typical 30 days to 38 days through the issuance of an addendum to the RFP document. So it was a planned uh, extension. 
Another OBO specific unique element of the design process is the requirement of congressional certification. The CD1 submission is a very important milestone as it will begin the DS review for certification. Diplomatic security will review the documents against their checklist to verify that all the requirements have been met or that they will be met by the completion of the process uh, project. Items related to anti-climb, anti-ram, anti-wander, ballistics, setbacks, and clear zones are all a few examples of the types of things they're looking at. This process typically takes approximately 90 days. However, depending on many factors, uh, we have seen it go longer. Uh, next slide, please. Mike, I think you're muted. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Uh, we'll now discuss the design goals of the embassy projects. Um, the design intent is provided, the basis of the design intent is provided in the bridging documents provided by uh, OBO with the RFP. Next slide, please. Although adapted to the individual embassy or consulate, overall, the design goals are a reflection of OBO's mission to provide security, resiliency, and stewardship. These goals include providing a high quality and constructible design, delivering a practical, resilient, and sustainable design, creating safe, functional, efficient facilities, providing a design that is representative of US presence in the host country, utilizing materials that are appropriate to the location and providing architecture that shows U.S. values and responds to the host nation's culture and traditions. As the contractor, we have to ensure that all of this is done within budget and schedule as provided by OBO. The key to all of this is balancing all of these goals with the security element intertwined within all. Next slide, please. Okay, architectural expression. Um, I'll begin the discussion uh, about the importance of the architectural in, uh, expression. One of the most important responsibilities of the design build team is to make sure that the bridging design intent is upheld throughout the design process. All decisions in the development of the project must stay true to the overall design intent to include major design elements all the way down to the smallest details. The architecture uh, must balance the design intent, architectural expression, security, and constructability, and will express and promote U.S. values while being sensitive to the local culture and regional architecture. In the case of Doha, uh, the Doha Embassy, some unique elements of the architecture are heavily influenced by the climate and the architecture responds by providing shade, water, features, and a natural cooling effect. The architecture is inspired by traditional regional typologies connected by shaded pathways and outdoor spaces. It also uses large cable tension shade structures hearkening back to uh, the traditional Bedouin tents uh, marking entryways to plazas uh, and also suspended over recreational areas and residential terraces. Another significant feature is the arcade, which connects the buildings and provides shade when walking around the camp, uh, around the compound. So I would just chime in here to highlight that there, there is a very significant role for site design and execution of that design when it comes to expression. The site design really does govern the representational impression of the compound for all of the different users, uh, whether they're entering the complex or even just passing by. So it's something that we pay very close attention to and seek to execute to a very high degree of quality. Next slide. As previously uh, noted, security is integral to all elements of the process of design development on an OBO project. 
we uh, discussed congressional certification briefly earlier. Uh, the requirements of diplomatic security are need to be met and are shown in the RFP package. This occurs at the 60% design submission of the project. What follows during the construction of the project is the uh, diplomatic security accreditation process. This is essentially the physical verification of what was certified at the design stage. This will go on through inspections periodically throughout the duration of the project, and then it will culminate in a final inspection by various members of the design uh, of the diplomatic security team. And this final accreditation is when you can hand over the building. Next slide, please. We're now going to move into the discussion on the design challenges to achieving the design goals that we've uh, discussed. Uh, as discussed earlier, we are using the Doha NEC project as our case study. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, design execution is of the greatest importance to keep the project on time and within budget. Uh, the execution of the final design and development of construction documents will require the DB team re-verifies the original assumptions that make up the bridging documents to include code review interpretation and to verify that all requirements have been met. The design build designer is also tasked with working closely with the contractor to verify that the design is constructible uh, as it progresses. I will also mention as a note of caution that it is possible that changes within the OBO and design, or sorry, and the diplomatic security team members can yield different interpretations on what is an acceptable way to meet a requirement. We always have to be careful and take this into consideration. Next slide, please. It's going to start to sound redundant, but as mentioned previously, security requirements are integrated in all aspects of the project and generally take precedence over all other drivers. As such, every design element has an enhanced level of complexity added automatically because of these security requirements. As designs get more sophisticated, the integration of security has grown in complexity as well. In decades past, the standardized designs allowed for uh, a pretty strict reuse of blue red book requirements of approved details for security. But as the design complexity has grown, the more nuanced applications are required to meet the security requirements and to prove that they're being met. An example of what Mike is getting at, um, another challenge is how security impacts how the building gets laid out uh, through the blocking and stacking plans and also is a driver on how the building functions. Uh, the creation of hard lines, adjacencies, and layering of access privileges all help to create a secure facility. Uh, I'd like to mention also that we're required to design to the tenant agency's criteria as well, which can occasionally be in conflict with uh, other contract requirements. So it's something uh, we're always looking at to make sure that the design comes in as a unified element and that all requirements are met. So finally on this slide, you see the bullet on lead integration. Uh, one of the things that the security ripple effect has a, an impact on that you might not think of is meeting the lead requirements for a project. So every project has a lead certification level that it is has a goal to achieve. Uh, some of the points that might normally be achievable on your projects uh, might be difficult to do, uh, such as daylighting within the buildings. Uh, or protecting and restoring habitat outside the buildings uh, due to blocking and stacking requirements, like Stephen mentioned, uh, as well as setbacks and clear zones in the site. Next slide. 
Okay, uh, other challenges include just the, the complexities of the design. Uh, there are many complexities that need to be worked out through the design process, may include delegated design. Uh, two significant examples on the Doha NEC project are related to tensile structures. The tensile fabric facade, uh, which protects from the harsh desert sun while maximizing the views to the extent possible from inside the new office building. Um, and the, the second is the tensile shade canopy, uh, which is made up of perforated metal panels tensioned over a stainless steel cable net. Both of these elements are so complex that they require specialty designers and manufacturers of which there are only a few capable in the world that can do this type of design. Uh, so the bridging documents develop these elements as much as needed to define the, the design intent. However, these comp uh, complex elements can be a real challenge to complete in the schedule of a design build project. So a couple of the other items related to site um, that are complex on this project and other projects. Uh, first deal with uh, the orchestration of the circulation through different garden areas that are meant for different users. Um, while there are separation of circulation requirements for people entering the American Center versus the consular windows versus the main entrance, uh, on a tight site, we have to maintain anti-wander standards between them. Uh, but within these gardens that we want to also integrate uh, for alternative uses, uh, such as special events, um, we have to find a way to provide the anti-wander requirements at the same time as allowing us to combine those spaces for the special events. Now, all of this will have been certified by DS originally. So as we're executing the project, it's a very delicate balance to maintain if we want to make any changes to that configuration so that we can maintain the DS approval. Uh, one of the other items that's a little bit complex on the Doha projects is the fountain systems. Uh, fountains aren't necessarily a common feature uh, on the OBO projects, um, but in the case of Doha with the climate, as well as with the available use of uh, reclaimed uh, treated sewage effluent water that's available from the city, uh, they do play a big role in the, in the bridging design that we receive. Um, so it's our job as a DB team to deliver those amenities while dealing with the uh, pretty complicated interplay between the treatment requirements for the water, the utility runs within an already complex site, uh, and the requirements to make it so these fountains can stay beautiful over time, thinking about maintenance going forward. Uh, so those are just a couple of the other site items. Uh, next slide. So another thing that is common to all of these OBO projects, um, but that has its own unique challenges in each place, is we call the host nation interface. Uh, there's always some uh, land surrounding the property, which separates the US government from the public realm within the municipality that we work. Um, so technically, we need to meet the grading requirements to make the site functional and drain appropriately. Uh, we need to hook up the utilities so that they become functional from a civil perspective. Um, but then we're also dealing with the expression that, uh, that Stephen mentioned earlier. Sometimes there's a very high, highly stylized design approach that we would like to take from the bridging design. But this may or may not clash with local standards and local requirements uh, for beautification. Uh, and in the case of Doha, that was no exception. Uh, they do have a master plan that we need to try to integrate with where our design is very different than the approach that they are planning to take. Um, you can see the couple of pictures at the bottom of the screen here. Um, this site is being continually developed while we're working. If you remember, the uh, World Cup was going on over the past several years, um, and a lot, of, a lot of things are happening around us as we work. Great. Uh, thanks, Jake. I'll also uh, just kind of interject and mention that the local permitting requirements can also impact the design if the local laws and regulations are more stringent than 
the international building codes with the OBO supplement codes uh, overlaid. Um, the transition of local utilities like power, telecom, and water, all requiring permits uh, that enter the compound at DMARC buildings may require very specific layouts that may not have been known at the at the onset of the project. Um, and so further coordination and continued coordination throughout the construction phase is required. Uh, next slide, please. So here we're gonna flesh out a, a few other issues that relate to landscape on the Doha project. We've touched on a couple of them. Um, so here we are, we have available to us reclaimed water from the city. It's a great asset. Uh, we want to make use of it from a sustainability perspective, but it does have limitations. Uh, for fountains, um, given that there are no uh, special OBO requirements for water treatment with regard to fountains themselves, uh, we have to interpret and obtain approval for how we're going to work with that water based on U.S. codes that might apply to pools and water features. Um, so that combined with the utility complexities that we've already talked about uh, have made uh, working with the fountains a particular challenge. Um, related to the use of the water as well, we have, uh, we're using it for the irrigation on the site. So all around the city, they're using the same water for irrigation. On our site, um, we're interpreting code requirements based on the testing of the water to mean that we can't use spray irrigation. Uh, if you see in the bottom right corner of the slide here, uh, we have a beautiful soccer pitch that we need to irrigate. Uh, to not do that uh, with spray, uh, the next logical approach would be to use flood irrigation so that we can keep it from aerosolizing into the air. Um, however, that's not a common practice, uh, either in the U.S. Uh, or in the Doha municipality. Uh, so working with AICI, SP, and OBO to set the parameters for that flood irrigation to make sure that it's efficient but effective. Uh, was a first step in the challenge. Uh, following up on that during commissioning to get the settings right will be the next step. Um, so that's uh, the reclaimed water. Uh, Security-wise, we've talked about the interplay between the different user groups in the gardens. Uh, one other challenge you might run into and want to look for uh, quick ahead of time as quickly as possible um, are the pool enclosures and the security requirements around those. Um, you can't have any kind of tree or woody stem plant within three feet or 915 millimeters of the pool enclosure. So we're looking at the plant substitutions that we need from the original design uh, that go against that requirement. Although we haven't had too many plant substitution requirements on this project, in general, planting the last bullet here is a key item to look at early in the project. Um, OBO has quite uh, sophisticated specifications and expectations for the plantings on the compound. Uh, the requirements come from U.S. horticultural code, um, but often those requirements are difficult to meet uh, with the industry standards that you'll find working elsewhere in the world. Some places it's highly developed, other places not so much. Uh, so working on getting the correct plants either imported or propagated uh, early on in the project, especially for the most highly visible plantings, uh, is very important. And we have run into a couple of issues with some of the most highly representative, representative uh, highly visible and representational plantings um, that have been difficult to, to purchase and source. Um, so something to think about ahead of time in the project. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, a little bit more about uh, the design challenges. Um, I kind of touched on it earlier, uh, but here it's highlighted as a heading, delegated design. Um, the, the tensile fabric facades and the tensile canopies that were mentioned earlier as examples of complex, unique designs. I also wanted to reinforce that the delegated design can be a real challenge to complete uh, during the design build project. I mean, just the time that's allowed uh, by contract uh, makes it difficult. 
Items requiring specialty designers, such as the tensile structures, FEBR, and blast windows and doors require extra attention and must be planned for from the beginning of the project. The challenge is to find uh, the balance between providing OBO and DS enough information to approve an issue for construction set of drawings while the design is still ongoing. As you know, the delegated design process uh, technically uh, historically happens after the design is, I mean, uh, during construction, but not always uh, can it be documented during an IFC set. Um, so OBO projects have become increasingly more complex, which yields a greater reliance on the de delegated design process and needs to be taken into consideration when determining the overall contract duration. That's a That's been a big challenge for us on this project. I'm going to discuss the early site packages. We discussed them a little earlier, um, but the key point here in the challenges section, although early site packages are very common in a um, design build world, the limited schedule time, you know, the project schedules are, are, are pretty tight. And in order to meet those, the construction team is looking to move quickly and get uh, out of the gate on the ground uh, and needs to move quickly out. The duality though here and why this makes it a challenge is that the 60% design, the CD1, is really going to drive your overall schedule because of the construction, uh, the congressional certification, uh, which is required in order to begin the construction on your chancery building. So it's balancing these two items that is uh, a critical challenge in uh, maintaining schedule on an uh, embassy project. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100% on you know the challenge that you just mentioned and having to had to deal with it throughout um, for many months. <laughs> And so uh, the last thing I was going to mention is uh, that embassies and consulates uh, don't only serve State Department, they also provide and maintain spaces for various other tenant agencies to include DOD and other government agencies. So each tenant has their own security requirements that are supposed to have been relayed to OBO and are included in the OBO's design criteria. So looking at at um, all the requirements, um, it, it it becomes a little bit complicated in some cases. However, um, it's it's one thing to be looking for uh, when you're looking at your scope of work. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now that we've talked about the process and noted some of the challenges, uh, we'll begin talking about some of the things we can do to mitigate those challenges. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, to begin with team composition, your design team uh, for a contractor, this starts right out of the gate when you're selecting your design partner. Uh, experience is critical for uh, in, an OB, in the OBO world. It's experience with OBO projects. Uh, and this starts right in as your uh, in your proposal preparation stage. Uh, OBO code requirements are extensive and uh, a new designer coming in who has no experience with the OBO program could not consume all of this information and in the duration of time of the bid. Uh, they need past knowledge of the OBO program. And as a contractor, you're, we're relying on that with our design partners. Uh, it's the reason we use the design partners that we do. We've been working with KCCT for the whole time we've been in this program, and KCCT has been in uh, the program far longer than us. Uh, one of the things that we see uh, valuable beyond just the time in the program, but is the experience on both sides of the table, so to speak. Um, they've worked as both the bridging designer on projects 
as well as as a design build partner with us and other companies. Uh, and that gives them a perspective that is uh, invaluable to us as the uh, contractor. Okay. Um, I touched on it earlier, but I'd like to reiterate that it's super important to know what's in your contract and to police the scope throughout the project. It should be noted that OBO subject matter experts make what uh, might make well-intended comments from a design standpoint that are very thoughtful and make a lot of sense, but they all sometimes may not know exactly what's in our comment or, or sorry, in our contract or how their comments um, may or may not be applicable to our scope of uh, work for this project. So it's up to the design build team to identify these issues. Um, and that's a very important point um, because we need to identify them and then communicate them to OBO. So if there are questions about the design intent or otherwise, it is recommended to seek input and clarification from OBO early in the project. Getting clarifications on the bridging design will help you better develop the project and inform the construction documents. Uh, this will ultimately help the contractor stay on task and on schedule. So one of the things I'll add in before we move on here, um, so Mike speaking from sort of the lead contractor perspective, and we're working with Stephen in support of the design team, um, we have to take our role as one of the sub-disciplines uh, very seriously in terms of knowing that if an issue is going to get addressed that relates to our area of expertise, it needs to be raised. Uh, it needs to be brought to the right people, and then it needs to be tracked through the different stages of the design. Because as Stephen said, uh, uh, teams change, reviewers change. So the things that are important to our discipline, we need to be responsible for carrying through and keeping track of the full project. Um, and so that that doesn't just go for um, you know the, the team leads. It's ev every discipline needs to participate in that. Uh, next slide. Um, I'll release you. Okay, to, to piggyback on what Jake was, was saying, um, and as alluded to earlier, it's important to identify any of the potential issues early, but it's equally important to document them. So paying special attention to the IDR comments and the whole process, and note any requests for variations that may be out of scope. We want to flag all potential cost, scope, and schedule impacts um, based on those comments and notify OBO as soon as possible of any discrepancies in the documents. Um, the simple process of documenting and notifying OBO of any issues will help to bring resolution quickly and to keep the design on track. Uh, I should mention that it's very important, good not just good practice, but very important to engage OBO in regular design meetings at the throughout the design process and to keep running a running log of issues, risks, and action items and to continue going through them until all items are resolved. Uh, communication. Uh, communication is key to resolving challenges. And this is across all entities and aspects of the project. Communication between designers, design team members, so that all disciplines are coordinated between the designers and the construction team. So everybody's on the same page and, and knows the uh, what's the priorities, what's the uh, goals, um, and that uh, we're all thinking the same. Between the contractor and OBO, uh, and that's all elements of OBO, the site team, the design office, SMEs, um, having a uh, Good open communication with all is critical uh, to uh, success. The early identification of concerns makes for better, more efficient resolutions. And as uh, Stephen brought up earlier, regular meetings, uh, checkups with, with all these different elements are uh, key to keeping uh, everybody on the same page and to getting to bring up issues as early as possible so that you can... Uh, get the best resolution. 
uh, partnering sessions. Uh, partnering is something that's uh, kind of new with OBO in the last uh, few years, um, but they're a great opportunity to connect all of the elements, some of which don't necessarily connect with each other all the time, but it's an opportunity for all of these to come together in, in, in one place. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we'll uh, now move into a discussion on lessons learned. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, one way to limit risk and to avoid spending a lot of time figuring out what is in the contract during the design is to ask as many bidder inquiries as possible during the bid time. This goes back again to knowing your scope of work uh, when, when bidding the project, because it'll have a significant impact on design, procurement, schedule, and cost. So if you can identify discrepancies and uncover any potential code issues early, you can head off these problems um, that may take time away from the design development process later. And always remember, uh, design build projects have a fixed schedule and budget. So, you know, Getting through the design is an important <laughs> aspect of, you know, getting this project built in a timely manner. Yeah, yeah, and, and continuing on from that point with uh, that Stephen just made, uh, these are firm fixed price contracts. Uh, a fixed price design build contract inherently carries a lot of risk to the contractor because of the fact that it's a fixed price on a design build. Uh, you need to go into that with your eyes open. Um, this is why bidder inquiries at the RFP stage are so critical. Um, you wanna make sure you're clarifying the scope as much as possible and to confirm that every that you're comparing apples to apples, both between the contractors bidding and to confirm your understanding of the scope is the same as the gov what the government is, is putting out there. Uh, this requires careful coordination between the contractor and the design partners to make sure that they all have an understanding of the approach to the project and the scope that is involved. Uh, as Stephen brought up earlier, this will continue through the project as you um, police the scope uh, during design reviews uh, and then on into uh, the construction. Uh, you want to make sure that the needs of the SMEs and the engineering team, et cetera, to, that they're going for with uh, the to meet the building requirements are what's shown in the contract. Uh, and if there is a conflict, you need to make sure you get with your COR early. Um, the earlier you bring up potential conflicts, better resolutions you can you can get to. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, as we've stated several times, it's it's vital to is this oh yeah, okay, sorry. Um, it's vital to secure diplomatic security approval for all elements of the design. However, it's important to pay special attention to the unique design elements uh, that are not part of the typical OBO DS standard details um, because those details may require testing, research, and development prior to being allowed on the project, which will take time. So as we all know, this can become very difficult in the, design, in the schedule of the design build project. Um, and it's imperative that these elements are uh, identified early and built into the overall project schedule. Um, working through issues with uh, DS, we're very thankful that you know they are willing to work through issues with us. However, it's not a it's not always a quick process. So these specialty elements really need uh, to start their um, their approvals in the bridging documents um, and then get finalized and carried forward in the design build IFC documents. Uh, this was brought up earlier in our strategies, but because of how important it is and how critical, I wanna bring it up again here in lessons learned, communication is 
a huge driver throughout um, any success you're going to have in this program. Uh, there's a lot of players involved, um, and it's you know spread across distances, time zones, um, extreme locations. Uh, so you can never focus too much on communication. Uh, you might need to make sure you have all the key players involved in your meetings. Um, communication amongst yourselves and among and with OBO, as we noted earlier, it allows for early and efficient resolutions when uh, problems arise. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, now we're going to shift gears. Um, designing and constructing U.S. embassies around the world is challenging, but all the hard work and due diligence can also be very rewarding. Uh, we'll, we will each take a moment to say what it is about these projects that makes it worth it, worth all the effort to us individually. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I'll go first. Um, as an architect, working on these projects is very satisfying because OBO emphasizes innovation and pushes the envelope with some of the world's most significant architecture. Uh, I'm proud to be part of the program and get great satisfaction ensuring the safety and security of our U.S. personnel, as well as American travelers overseas. Um, I'm honored to participate in helping to create the first experience of engagement to the United States that many people will have at these facilities, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to uh, travel the world as part of my job. Yeah, I'll go next. Um... First of all, this is rewarding uh, to hear Ambassador Moser uh, recognize that it's a partnership effort uh, to get these complex, difficult, but rewarding projects done. Um, I'll just add that in. But in general, um, I do take a lot of pride in working on these projects, which often become quite iconic. Um, they become the face of our nation to the world. Um, can't not be proud of that. Um, but as Stephen mentioned, OBO really does push sustainability, innovation. Uh, those can be challenging things. Those can show up in the list of complexities that we've talked about. Um, but solving them, solving those problems, making it work, uh, that makes it all the more rewarding, rewarding as well. Yes, as the others have noted, um, it's 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 rewarding because of all of the things that are listed here on this slide. Um, you they give you a sense of pride in the product you're delivering. Um, additionally, I can say as a contractor, I think it's interesting work because it's not just the challenges of construction of a building itself. It's all the other aspects beyond just the construction. It's the logistics. It's the foreign unique locations. It's the security requirements. It, it's not just building another uh, condominium down the street. It's um, it, sometimes, you know, all these challenges we've noted, those are the things that drive you crazy every day, but um, it's what makes it interesting, solving those things. Uh, I, that'll wrap up our presentation and uh, we'll move into the uh, Q&A session. Yes, thank you very much, um, Michael, Stephen, and Jake. That was uh, really great information that you uh, just shared with us. Um, before we jump into the Q&A, I want to take a moment uh, just to highlight some different ways that uh, folks on this call uh, may be able to work for OBO as an employee. Uh, we hire uh, both civil service, uh, professional service contractors, foreign service special specialists, and we also have internships. So uh, we realize that a few of you on this call may be uh, trying to find more information, not just about the projects, but how to work with us. So we wanted to provide that for you. Um, and then additionally, there are a couple of ways uh, you can get in touch with us. You see on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, we've got something that we refer to as our capability conversations. And those are 20 minute conversations that firms can have with OBO subject matter experts. So uh, please 
uh, feel free to scan that QR code. You can also go to the Build With Us page on the OBIA website for that information. And also on the OBIA website, we have a tab for careers, so you can find more information about um, any of those types of uh, careers that I listed uh, on the previous slide. Um, with that said, I'm going to invite all of our panelists and our OBO subject matter experts, our friends from AQM and OSDBU to please come back on screen. Um, and we are going to jump right into uh, some questions. We've got a couple for um, that came in while, while we were doing the presentation. And the first one uh, is from Samir. They're wondering, how can a subcontractor, a small GC out of the U.S., like himself, be a resource for a &E for future greenfield construction with a, within OBO. Anyone want to jump in here on OBO? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give an answer, Lauren. You you already forecast some of it. Sign up for a capabilities conversation, and you can get a better idea where you might fit in. Stay in touch with AQM on what contracting opportunities are coming out. Great. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate you jumping in on that one. Um, we've got uh, one for the project team members. Um, sorry to put uh, Stephen, uh, Jake, and Michael back on the hot seat, but um, <laughs> can you describe any helpful hints on collaborating with uh, such a broad range of stakeholders on the government side? Uh uh, I guess I'll start, and uh, I think I'll default to something we reiterated a couple of times in the in the presentation. Communication. It's um, there are a lot of stakeholders, and uh, um, so communication is critical. And 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 you want to be able to you know you need to communicate with the OBO team on site, and as much as possible, you want to run things through them. Um, but there are so many other stakeholders. There is things that you're trying to keep up with with their uh, personnel back here as well. Um, but you definitely don't want to do that blind to the uh, OBO site team. So it's a balance. Um, but like I say, I, th I would go communication. Uh, just you know, you can't you can't push it too much. Yep, yeah, Mike. I'll just add to what you're saying. I think. Um... The idea that uh, the working closely with the COR, um, in particular on the design build project, you know, the, your um, the uh, sorry, something's going on with my screen here. The PD on site, um, you know, we we really do need. Uh, we have a couple point people, however, we really need the OBO team uh, team leaders to organize those stakeholders and bring them to the table for a discussion. We can request meetings through them. However, we do rely on OBO uh, leadership, um, team leadership to get the appropriate people into these meetings. Um, and that's where a lot of things can get worked out. Um, that's all I wanted to add. Thanks. Yeah, and if I could as well, I'm not on the contractor's team, but I am with our <laughs> Office of Construction Management. And I just, I really wanted to reiterate that point as well. And I think one of the things we've seen that has been successful for the Doha team is exactly what they're talking about, that they they have been explaining the different issues to our project director, to our field teams, whether through the partnering meetings or whether through just the weekly meetings, however they are doing it, because we definitely can't solve a problem that we don't know about. We can't always say yes, but by asking us the questions and having the conversations, it really helped us do what we can do to help overcome the different challenges. Great, thank you for jumping in, Lisa. And anyone else on the OBO side, AQM or OSDBU, at any point during the questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, the next question that came in is, um, how does OBO determine the contract time? And do they include the contractor in this process, especially with the fixed price setup? This is a loaded one. I don't know who wants to take it. <laughs> Lisa, that one's yours. I think you're muted. 
No, I actually, sorry, something happened on my screen too, and I missed the question. If you would quickly repeat it. I will do my best to answer. I'm so sorry. Absolutely, Lisa, no problem. Um, so does OBO, uh, how does OBO determine the contract time? And do they include the contractor in this process, especially with the fixed price setup? So I guess the second answer is not exactly. We do, through our development process, come up with what we believe the duration of the project reasonably should be. And we base it on different specifics. We're dealing with an upcoming potential project in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, that has a lot of challenges uh, that are going to determine the duration of that project uh, based on the cold. Uh, you know, so we do our best, almost like design intent, to, to figure out what is the logical way that this project can get done. And also, that's the duration we kind of want it to be done in, right, as an owner. We have seen then sometimes there's bitter inquiries where if a company feels that we've really missed the mark, we say they, you know, someone might say like, this doesn't seem right. Uh, but we've also had other projects where the contractors come in and say, you guys said 60 months, but we can do this in 48, maybe not quite that dramatic. Uh, I would say, I think that's the sort of standard way we do things. When we do a best value solicitation, sometimes schedule can be one of the determining characteristics or whatever we call those, determining factors of how we make the best value award. Um, but right, I guess the, the short answer is we do determine it and we then ask the contractors to all come in within that duration or raise something at the bidder inquiry level. Thanks, Lisa. Um, another question that came in, uh, can you describe more the construction administration process? In particular, the on-site oversight the AE team may be involved with, or is this done remotely? I'll go ahead and start this and maybe Mike or someone else can chime in. But generally speaking, um, the AE team on the, well, the design side of the design build team is very um, uh, involved at the beginning of the project with an initial site visit all the way through design. And then we continue to work very, very hard to stay ahead of the contractor with the RFIs and the submittals and keeping the process moving. Um, when design's over, obviously, um, that it well, it's really never over until you hand over the project. But um, we do um, generally when we price, when we put together our fee proposal, we'll have the cost of the trip, the primary trip into the schedule um, as part of our fee proposal, and then we'll work with the contractor. And if, depending on what they think they may need, we will ask them to sort of set aside a certain amount of money um, in their bid as part of their bid that could be dedicated to these trips. Now, um, usually we'll get a call to come out to site um, sometimes if there's a problem, but more often. It's we're being asked to come to site when OBO um, reviewers are on site looking at, um, you know, trying to accreditate the, uh, accreditate the space and before closing in. Um, so our that lump sum amount of money that we ask the contractor to keep on hand uh, could go to any any of the design team members. It doesn't um, you make a trip, then, you know, it gets covered. Uh, but we're not there posted on site usually. Um, we don't, we go occasionally to check on progress or um, for specific reasons, but we don't, um, we don't have a, a seat in their trailers. I, I, does that answer the question? I don't know. That's it. Yeah, I think basically to sum it up, it is predominantly handled remotely um, and then with visits as needed. Uh, for for specifics, that's a lot faster way of saying it. <laughs> yeah, from 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 the owner's side, I'll add. You know, OBO one of those positions that Lauren pointed out. We have foreign service officers that live abroad with their families for the entire duration of the con of the contract, overseeing construction as the COR, the contracting officer's representative, on site. We also hire local architect engineering team members. 
and then the original design architect from the United States is involved um, from helping us review design intent on our design build projects and our design bid build projects, assisting us as an owner's rep, answering RFIs, reviewing specific submittals and so forth as well. Thank you. Um, the next question that came in uh, somewhat piggybacks on that. Um, can both AI, CISP, and KCCT uh, tell us about how they worked with the local designers or the subcontractors in DOA? Okay, so I, you know, we have a vast amount of, uh, you know, local subcontractors um, in terms of, uh, you know, how, how we work with them. It's, you know, like, I guess, a typical subcontracting situation. It's, it's the need, you know, the need and what can be provided. Uh, so um, there's, there's a variety of uh, subcontractors that we've used locally. You know, Doha is a location that is, um, you know, they've got a very strong construction uh, uh, existence there. You know, you go to some locations and you don't have that. You know, you don't have the, the level of sophistication of, of U.S. construction um, in Doha. We're, we're, we're fortunate that uh, it is a pretty, um, it, it's a very sophisticated uh, con uh, world of construction there. Um, so that, uh, hopefully answers, uh, that question. I'll, I'll just chime in on that from, from an architect standpoint, um, normally there's somewhat limited involvement for local AEs to participate in this. However, at the beginning of a project, helping us to understand the, uh, codes, uh, that we need to meet locally or translate documents or things of that nature. Um, either KCCT or the contractor um, will hire, have someone on someone on site, uh, not, not on site all the time, but someone they can reach out to that's local to help uh, through the permitting process. So that includes translation of documents and making sure that they're talking to the right people and it's more of a liaison kind of position for the local architects, um, less design, more uh, being helpful with the process. Yeah, and I'll chime in on that as well for the landscape architecture discipline as well. So particularly in the bridging design phase, when we're get more getting to know the site, analyze the site, getting to know the local uh, nursery trade, uh, navigating everything local and permitting as well. Um, that's where we've seen more involvement uh, at that stage. Thank you. Um, and well, Jake, you said the magic word, which was bridging. Um, so that, that'll that take us to our next question. Um, this one came in asking if uh, you can discuss more the handoff of the bridging documents to the DB team. Does the bridging design team provide any support post DB award? Yes, maybe I'll jump in a little bit on that one. <clears throat> so, yes, the bridging, the handoff is that's basically the, what the set that gets bid to the design build team. Um, so they're reviewing that package, which is going to be completed. The design will be completed and then constructed by the contractor. Um, and yes, the original design team, um, they're there assisting us answering RFIs during the bidding period, bidder inquiries. Um, and then they're involved throughout the life of the construction as well. Thanks, Curtis. Appreciate you jumping in on that one. Uh, the next one that came in is asking if security requirements limit the ability of specialty designers or innovative approaches. I guess I can I can start that maybe um, just by saying that the security, although we've we see it as a challenge often. It's not also. It's not only a challenge. It's an opportunity to think differently and to become more creative with how you solve problems. Given, giving um, a structure of within parameters. So, um, that I just wanted to start the conversation by saying that I don't know who else may want to speak. And I'll jump in here a little bit to say, you know, I think it it, it can. 
but it can also be overcome. I, I think that this is something that I think probably OBO and us as the um, contractors and the design, you know, this is something we all probably do need to look at a little more is as the designs have become more complex, uh, OBO's designs have become, more, you know, we moved out of the standard embassy program over a decade ago and they've become more and more complex. Um, you do have more of these unique design elements. And one of the things that we see is difficult is if that design element isn't taken far enough in its security evaluation during the bridging stage, it's very difficult to get through that in the duration of the design build contract. So the it can be done and I'm and it gets done a lot in the, but I, I think the more, that a specialty design element is addressed for its security concerns in the bridging stage, the better chance for success for everyone involved. Yeah, I'll reiterate that it can, and the, the more you can look at it as an opportunity, the more it can become a, a specialty innovative design element in itself. So when it comes to perimeter security from the landscape side and the site side, um, you really have to look at how it can be integrated with landscape structures, planters, things like that. Um, so you may end up seeing a unique design that is actually because of the security requirements. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a straightforward approach with your uh, bollards. And sometimes uh, you'll see something very unique that can be integrated. But again, as long as it's well enough worked out uh, as early as possible in the process. Thank you. Um, and actually, it's perfect that you're the last one who spoke, Jake. We've got one coming in. Um, you described uh, using locally sourced plantings. Um, what other material and equipment are you able to uh, source locally? So not just specifically for for uh, landscape. This is open up to everybody, but uh, you, you were the one who mentioned the plantings um, locally being locally sourced. So just want to see what the project yeah. team or OBO has uh, to jump in and say. So the full the full design build process is leading toward a local landscape contractor doing maintenance for one to three years uh, before full handoff to OBO. So from the very beginning, you're planning for who are the local landscape contractors going to be. Uh, and we've worked in situations where there are very, very sophisticated large companies that can provide all of their own equipment and staff uh, for maintenance, et cetera, uh, as well as installation. Um, but there are other areas where that is just not the case. Um, some projects that are going on right now in places where there is no local infrastructure to provide um, the installation or the maintenance. And in that case, the contractor is looking for neighboring countries and what they might be able to provide and how to bring them on board. Um, so yeah, at the bridging side, a lot of research gets done about what's available and what's not available. Uh, and based on what's not available, start planning very far in advance for how you're gonna get it. And I would say, you know, looking at the project as a whole, it, you know, kind of piggybacking on what Jake said, it, it really varies on the location of the project, um, depending on the look, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Doha has got a very sophisticated construction market. Uh, so yes, there are a lot of things that you can get locally, or if it's not actually produced locally through local sources, uh, bringing it in from other locations. Um, but there's, there's other places where you very much have to bring most uh, most things in. Um, so it really varies on the location. I mean, uh, because of what OBO is representing the State Department, they are everywhere in the world. So you have every possible scenario out there. So Mike, uh, I imagine that that certainly plays into your thinking um, about at the bid stage, even what it's gonna take to supply the project. Um, for us, it might come in a little bit later. We're gonna get familiar with what the plant material requirements are. And in some cases, it's going to require actual propagation, uh, starting as early as possible, on-site propagation, setting up an entirely new nursery just for the project. 
uh, sometimes that's the only way to do it. Um, another thing in terms of importation of plant material, um, you have to look out for um, agricultural uh, bans on importation of certain material in certain countries. Um, if that's not something you're anticipating, you might have shipments that come in and the customs folks will burn it and you're out of luck. <laughs> um, so these are just some nitty gritty examples of what to anticipate so that you leave yourself with as much time as possible to propagate in terms of plant material if you need it. Jake's, Jake's right on point with that one. We have found that with fly ash in some countries, for example, difficult to import. Um, primarily, we focus on the performance characteristics of the material to try to provide uh, the contractor as much flexibility as possible in terms of whether that's stone pavers or stone for the building or interior finishes. Um, we do prefer, obviously, local woods and local materials as there is a uh, that helps with the cultural contextual element for the representational quality of the projects. But primarily, it's a performance driven um, specification that the contractors are asked to bid and then they have that flexibility to import that material. Planting runs a little bit different, though. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, that came in. Uh, from your perspectives, what is driving the increasing complexity and uniqueness of OBO designs? So this would be great to uh, hear from both sides. Uh, I guess um, maybe I can start by saying that, um, you know, Creating great innovative architecture is, you know, something that that's coming out of this program. I mean, the most recent embassies, when when looked at as a portfolio of buildings and projects, are truly amazing. Um, very, very different from what we were seeing in the previous um, SED days, standard embassy design. So. Uh, the complexities are really inherent in wanting to create great architecture. That is, that's part of it. However, you know, it also has to do with um, all the people you're trying to serve and where you're trying to do it from. Um, and then uh, I'm sure there's many other perspectives on this, but truly it, an easy answer is creating amazingly innovative and awesome buildings. Um, is complicated. We're not doing just uh, boxes anymore. I can't speak probably as well as Tracy and others to the, the value of the dollar and how far that goes on a construction site. Um, I can say that we actually have implemented close to 3,000 standardized elements that we now provide that BIM module of a standardized element in our building to the design team. They may be comprised in unique ways for each unique program, but you're going to see the standardized elements in project after project after project. It's just they're composed in different ways for the different functional needs of that particular post. And, and we're really kind of moving away from innovating for the for innovation's sake. Like the architecture should be performative and functional and easy to maintain. And we've incorporated a number of measures into our design process that involves our teams from facilities in the design process. So, um, but we are still able to get some of that innovation while still meeting all of the functional, operational, and maintenance requirements um, of the program as well. So we're trying to strike that balance. I believe we're doing a pretty good job of being able to still be um, architecture that looks innovative uh, while still meeting and doing being something that can be easily maintained and uh, easy easier to construct than uh, maybe we, they have been in the past. I hope you all feel the same way. I, I may opine on the subject as well. I'm not an architect, uh, but if, if maybe some of you have said, you know, you had to answer a question and so you get, you know, a really long answer and then, well, I didn't have time to give you a shorter answer because of the effort it takes to actually think about a meaningful short answer, for example. So I, I, mean, I would challenge all of our designers that uh, it doesn't have to be, complex for complexity's sake, or as, as uh, Curtis just said, innovation for innovation's sake. But there can be simplicity, it can be extremely hard to get there, but in the end, simplicity can be that statement that has every element behind it and doesn't 
just yell at you that you're that you're too complex. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it that way. I'm a person that embraces simplicity. Uh, one thing that came to mind, uh, am I on mute? No. Um, that we see in one particular project that's ongoing now is sustainability can be uh, can get you a long way toward security as well, self-sufficiency, uh, reuse, uh, those kinds of things. And when we push far in that direction, it it can get complex on how to manage the water on the site, um, for example, in terms of stormwater. But if you can achieve a sustainable solution, that's a long-term security measure actually for the post. Um, so we we understand when we're pushing hard to try to make things like that work, that there's more to it than uh, just making, making the water management look beautiful. Thank, thanks, Jake. Um, uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and uh, the one that we're gonna close out on, are there lessons learned, knowledge, or um, any knowledge that anyone would like to share that contractors recommend that bridging designers implement to improve the projects on the construction side? Um, I guess, I, like I said, I think I brought it up earlier. I uh, brought it up earlier. Um, the element of if we are going to introduce a unique uh, design feature that is especially that has a security element to it that it gets um, that it gets carried far enough along at the bridging stage uh, that that would be my you know big takeaway there because uh, there just isn't a lot of time to solve a unique design and, and run it through the gauntlet of of security uh, during the um, the uh, duration you have for a design build project. Thanks, Michael. Um, I want to uh, thank everyone for for joining us. I don't know, Tracy, if you want to say anything before I hand it over to Megan. Um, but obviously, thank you to our presenters. Um, and Tracy, if there's anything you'd like to close out with, please jump in. Yeah, I'll just underscore the thank you very much to our presenters. Excellent presentations, great conversation and interaction. I think for our first Reverse Industry Day, it was, I'm going to give you two thumbs up. It was excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. And I just want to bring back um, the Acting Director of External Affairs, Megan Siebold, to uh, close us out. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lauren. You did a great job moderating. And thanks, everyone, for really active participation. Have to give credit to Managing Director Tracy Thomas for ideating this and coming to this. I think it's, it's a great way to have a different kind of interaction with our industry partners. And thank you so much, AICI Special Projects, KCCT, RHI. Really appreciate your time today and the very practical tips you had for challenges and solutions. And thanks to Director Moser for his leadership, OBO staff that was here to answer questions, AQM, OSDBU, a lot of acronyms that I just threw at you. Um, but thank you all so much for participating in US Department of State Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations Virtual Reverse Industry Day and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.